All right, so um, welcome. And uh, yeah, uh, thanks for, for signing up. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do is to actually run a poll on how everyone's feeling today. So it, it appears that 71% um, of you are doing good. I think it's a bit vulnerable to say that you're really struggling right now. So um, about 10%, four of you are extremely happy. Uh, and about seven of you are just okay. So that was just a fun fact at the bottom of how many tabs are open in your browser right now. So most of you, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering how, how many tabs you have open. Then there's, uh, it's not, it wasn't really going anywhere. That was just for fun. Okay, so let me stop that right now. Can I just check that everyone who was supposed to be here is here? Yeah, I see Tamsin. Okay, let's get on with, with the schedule. So that was interesting. And so I just want to start uh, by talking about how this happened. Um, so about a year ago, I was uh, driving um, on my way to, to teach at a university in Singapore. And uh, when suddenly a really clear thought um, dropped into my mind. Um, and these, these thoughts were so clear. And as the words came in, my, my eyes started tearing up and I did not understand what was happening. And this was what it was, essentially, it was about culture over community. You see, I, I had been pursuing the idea that designing experiences and products for people would bring transformation. However, what culture over community means is that rather than pursuing methodologies, new designs and ideas, we need to be transformed in our minds and our behavior first. That's why it's culture first. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. If you wanna to get to the root of problems, it's really about culture. So it's not something that you can own. You can't really put your name to it. You can't take credit for it. But culture is sustainable and can transmit across borders. It transmits across generations, right? So this is a bit of why I'm doing this. Um, if you don't really get it, I can, I can share more when there's time. I'm going to try to, you know, um, to move through the slides, uh, and give more time to, to having a chat. Right. And so, um, it's taken a while to get to this point where I've understood that my purpose is actually to encourage others. And today I want to talk about design without the jargon because jargon really alienates people. It excludes people from understanding what you really mean. So if, the, if this encouragement comes through helping others to make clear decisions, if it helps to increase your confidence, or if it's about learning about methodologies, so be it. Anything I can do to encourage others. And um, I want to share how this approach has really helped me to design a really wide variety of um, services, systems, brands, organizations, uh, resorts, software. Uh, it's really been a blast. So I just really want to share that. And what I, my dream for everyone is, is to have a wide open space uh, where they're not really having problems breathing down your neck. And uh, so this is Mongolia, where I, where I was with my family about two years ago. So the, I've never seen, um, you know, a more a wider expanse in my life. Uh, and uh, yeah, I really, you know, I, in, in 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 a sort of philosophical way, I really hope that everyone will will will, will get to this really wide open space where you have the freedom, uh, you are calm enough to make really good decisions. And, and to really be brave and, and to take certain steps uh, into the adventure that lies ahead of you, right? So, yeah, I really want to get back there one day. Just goes on forever. It's so amazing. Um, and so sometimes, you know, in, 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 in 
in our lives today, we just have to brush off all that noise, all that distraction uh, in this season. You know, there's a fair amount of stress and uncertainty. So, um, you know, when I, when I was on, uh, driving to that class at, at the university, uh, I had about 200 students, first year students, cream of the crop. And it was interesting that we were trying to find problems to design for. And everything that everyone was talking about well, sounded like social issues, finding a partner. And yet when, it, when, when push came to shove, what they really cared about was life direction. And I realized how many students were not equipped uh, for the life that was ahead of them. And then uh, a survey was done recently amongst 2000 employees in this season, uh, you know, about their emotional state of mind. And I just wonder how many of you would relate to this? Um, yeah, simply would, how many of you would relate? Uh, so I think personally, definitely. Uh, and, and so that, that's a bit of context of, of what's going on. In terms of the people who registered for this, um, for this uh, workshop, if you were to call it that, um, at least, you know, a very large percentage really want to be using design to solve human problems. And that's really, really where it's at. It's about people. Um, when, when we're brought in to troubleshoot technology and systems or even brands, it's often a human problem. And so when I talk about UX, um, I'm not talking 100% about, you know, digital interaction. I'm talking about people and, and, and really helping people the best, the best way we, we, we can. So um, before this, I would like to launch another poll for fun. It's quite fascinating. There's a wide array. And I think the point is that, um, yeah, no one goes through life without any, any trauma. And often it's people that cause that. So um, yeah, this, again, this was for fun, All right. Uh, something else, I'm just really curious. How many, you know, higher numbers would we see? So, um, Tamsin, are you there? I am, hello. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna stop uh, sharing for a second and I'm going to let, uh, wait, let me, there was actually a slide to just put your name up. And uh, yeah, Tamsin's a friend. Is the screen still sharing, by the way? I can see I can see a gallery of participants right now. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Would you like to introduce yourself and 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 yeah, tell us why you're here? <laughs> Thank you, Ruben. I, I'd be glad to do that. Um, there was so much resonance already in your opening speech. I was making a few little notes there going, oh, yes, 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 exactly. Ruben and I met because we also used to teach together. In fact, though, I think we first met speaking at a conference and we discovered we had a lot of similar thoughts. So that's been great. I'm, um, so I'm Tamsin Grody-Smith. I'm director of something called the School of X at Design Singapore. Um, so School of X is something that was announced last year. And I'm currently, my colleague Elias is also here. We're currently trying to build the School of X. So I hope you would be, would be able to invite you all in. School of X is, is very much around trying to look at the role of human-centered design in solving real world challenges. And that's why I, I absolutely love the point you made, Ruben, about designing out the jargon. Yeah, my, my, big, my big aim with School of X is to democratize design and show how it's very relevant to everyone in, in different parts of our life. So that really we can have everyone across Singapore saying, wow, design has helped me feel more empowered and helped me to solve my own problems. So um, School of X is, is a real world learning platform. We'd love to share more with you as and when we're ready to really get started and launch it. I think 
the interesting thing for me is that I stumbled into human centered design by accident by trying to solve real world problems. Uh, and I've been doing that for about 25 years. I think I found myself being drawn into situations um, so you may be able to tell from my accent, I'm not from Singapore originally, I'm from the UK. And in the UK, we like to protest. Yeah, we love to get angry and say, no, I, refu I refuse to wear a mask. My human rights will be infringed if I wear a mask, this kind of thing, yeah. And I found very early in my career, I was being brought into situations where people were protesting. And very often, the, the reason for the protest did make sense but it was because people were coming from a certain perspective and they couldn't see the other viewpoint. Uh, one of my, I guess, early career experiences of this was in the mobile telecoms um, world. And everyone had only just started getting these lovely devices and saying, I really want to use a mobile phone, but I don't want a mobile phone mask anywhere near my home or my child's school or my place of work. So make the technology work, but I don't want the infrastructure near me. And that was impossible. And I was working with some, one of the mobile telecoms companies to try to work with the community protesters. And as I worked with them, I realized, yeah, these guys really have got a point. They feel something's being forced upon them. But the telecoms operator said, yeah, but we have the right, the logical right to build. So the approach I took was to, to use a co-creation approach before I even knew what that was. I brought together the community protesters with the telecoms engineers and started exploring and unpacking the issues until we could get to a point where we, we found a solution. And the community stopped protesting because they had been involved, they, they stopped protesting because they'd been involved in the design journey. Yeah, they felt the solution met their needs. They wanted the technology, but they'd been concerned and they didn't feel involved. So it was really, the, that was really the beginning of my design journey, I think probably around the year 2000, 1999, uh, around that time, a long time ago, huh? Um, and so from that point onwards, it's always been, um, my approach has always been to use a human centered design approach to tackle these very big complex issues. Um, and I felt actually at one point in my career, whenever there was a bad news story about some developer doing something wrong, I dreaded the phone ringing because I waited for them to call and say, can you help? But very often they would help because I realized that by engaging our stakeholders and working with them, we, we really can solve what seemed like impossible problems. Um, so those issues that are complex and difficult usually relate to human beings. And when we understand their motivations and their pain points, it's much easier to define a way forward that works for everyone. So I always push the clients I'm working with or my students to look for the multiple win solution. And I guess one of my little bugbears is sometimes Design thinking is used just to help um, on a commercial front, yeah. How do I get more people to become addicted to my product or service? And that's fine if it's a really worthy service. What I'm interested in is how do I get all of us to be addicted to this? Yeah, how does this work? How do we create the win-win-win solution that genuinely works for all the players? So that's what we're interested in looking at. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward today to hearing everyone else's interests and motivations and, and really building this community of people who are inspired to bring empathy into their design for social good in the broadest sense of social. Cool. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was great. My, my rant of the morning. Luckily, you missed my earlier rant. Poor Elias had that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we... we... We, oh, it, I should have used that quite a journey. my back photo, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it's all, it's all come together very quickly, by the way, everyone. So apologies if, if, there, if, if you know, yeah. there's still a few things, a rough, rough bits to, to sort out. Um, but, um, all right, so let me jump right, right in. I'm going to try to keep this as short as I can. You know, I, I think the aim isn't to impress and the aim isn't to uh tell you everything but i think it's really to get the conversation started so um this is um screen sharing's working just a visual confirmation yep okay thank you um so uh at the age of five my grandfather bought me a piano and i thought this is it uh i know what, what's ahead of me for life it's it's gonna be music uh it took a long time i don't know how long at least 20 years to realize that it wasn't just the music. Um, it was really about encouraging others, which was really why I enjoyed playing. 
And so that if you look at the top, um, I'm creating a little journey here. So excuse the jargon, but I'm creating a little user journey for myself. And I uh, went to design school, had a blast. I was finally stepping in a direction of, of coming alive, things I really enjoyed and was good at. It was supposed to be a high point. And I designed uh, a pen that uh, merged physical and virtual realities, sold it to a, a venture cap uh, uh, firm in, in France, and they never paid me. And so that was supposed to be a high point. It turned out to be one of the you know, uh, first of, of, of many difficult, um, uh, yeah, bumps in, in the road ahead, heartbreaks. And then I realized that designers don't really know how the world works. Um, and so I went to business school. That was all right. Um, couldn't get a job anywhere. Ended up uh, managing a neuroscience lab for three years. And it was there that uh, I really, the light started coming on um, about how it's not just about design, it's about people and the systems they're in and how they feel. And so I had to manage lots of data and that was just a, big, a very unlikely beginning to my journey. Um, I ended up in a service design or experience design studio that, that was one of the early pioneers of design thinking in Asia. And it was such an impactful time in my life um, being in an organization where the culture was, you know, everyone felt safe and happy to contribute. We were doing amazing work. So this was the same team that created new brands for banking, like Frank for OCBC. Uh, we, we were re reimagining resorts. We were reimagining retail experiences and um, even making, uh, laying out blueprints for the legal processes in, in the Singapore court system. And so this was really where um, it, I was starting to get a sense of direction on what I should do with design and really about you know, empathy for, for people. So this really set me off. And then um, in 2015, I lost my second daughter. Zoe was 10 weeks old when, when her heart suddenly stopped. And we, we just realized that we had just been so busy uh, we had been in Singapore then uh, about three years. And, you know, the, the mentality was that we don't know how long we'll be here. We'll, we won't really put pictures up on the wall and we'll wait for the next best thing to come along. And the lesson we got out of this is that life is short and you really need to invest yourself wherever you are um, and get happy. You know, invest your, yourself in the community uh, with friends and just don't hold back. And uh, so that's really um really one of another pivotal moment uh in, in 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 my life and if that wasn't bad enough i went into the corporate world and got exposed to you know uh this was actually a worse worse time than than losing my daughter i'm sad to say you know uh to to be to be in quite a toxic environment where um you know so much power and money around and and you know words have so much power and if you, if, you, if you were to have a word bank of toxic words and to see that what the impact of that can be upon people, it's, it's really quite scary. So, so this is something I'm passionate about, culture from that point of, from that angle. And on that, you know, this is a quote that, that I'll never forget, that where people really won't, uh, they, they will forget what you did or what you said, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And that's something, that is one that, that that's a that's a stronger sensation than taste you know sometimes when i when i smell certain things it brings me back to childhood but this is really where it's at so i think this is very central um spend a bit of time um, um working on artificial intelligence and so that's a, another site um well it was a, it was it was a, an upwards move uh and and i was starting to to get a sense of all right i really enjoy this What's next? Well, at this point, I'd just like to talk about a user journey in general. So in design, often um, we try to bring all the lower bumps up and that's basically a, a job well done. And yet without the ups and downs in life, I wouldn't have this perspective of where I am right now. 
haven't made it yet. Uh, we're not running this uh, event because the business is, you know, there, 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 there's, there's too much uh, cash in the bank. Uh, it's not quite that. It's still very challenging at the moment. But I think um, there is a tension of being in, in design or, or, or trying to design something and trying to make everything perfect. So I think the very first thing is that actually it's I don't think it's about perfectionism. It's about understanding the journey. Sometimes you have to live a little, you've got to take some risk and it's not always going to work out. But I think um, it's really about understanding your purpose. So um, yeah, it kind of looks like birds on a wire actually. And so what I did was that um, I decided to start a design consultancy that focuses on purpose to serve others. And um, yeah, it's been a bit challenging as a, as a, as a small team uh, in, this, in this season, uh, but it's been really great. And so at this point, I just want to talk, okay, since the word UX was used, um, I shall talk very briefly about the UX process. We start in the top left-hand corner um, of really understanding and listening actively to understand the context of what's going on. And then on the top right, we start to analyze the information that we've collected. By understanding uh, and, and interpreting the information that we've collected, we're then able to prioritize what's important and work with it to create a design, a strategy on how to do well, how to succeed, and how to remove all the pain points. And then we measure the success. Have we done a good job? And then we start again. So roughly, that's, that's a design framework. However, you know, there's so much jargon today. Um, some people really get excited when you talk about service design, when you talk about UX transformation. What's next? It'll never end. Uh, this has been going on for, for as long as I know. And, and, and I think it really comes down to, if you look at the word service design, it's about serving others. If you look at user experience, it's about users. If, if it's about transformation, what are you transforming? It's people. And so, so my view is that it really just needs to be a really holistic way of doing whatever you can to solve problems for people to make their lives better. And, and it's very idealistic. And so that uh, got us on a journey of, um, trying to see, could we gather people? This is not our office, by the way, uh, but this was the dream. This was, you know, a uh, uh, light to, to lead us forward. And, and the dream was to bring people in, in, in our neighborhood uh, to come and have conversations. And so the first thing we did uh, was to do some meetups in our small office space. We crammed, uh, and the second version of this, we crammed about 18 people in a tiny office. And um, yeah, we realized how many people were really struggling um, uh, in different circumstances and 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 you know not to be dramatic but um, there, there is a lot going on where, where people are, have, have just been so so um, traumatized by by some of their experiences that we, we thought okay how are we gonna do this, are we gonna become a charity and just do this? Uh, how far can we go? You know, when someone starts opening up about their life, it takes more than two hours to hear the whole story, right? So um, I just wanna share um, four steps on how to design an ideal experience. And uh, it's interesting looking at, at the profile of people I asked, you know, how many years of experience have you got? We have a very high percentage of people with more than 20 years who have registered. And so i um, happy to have a chat about whether you agree or disagree on this, but this is something that I use to, to approach complexity. And so um, yeah, here's actually, I just realized this is, this is a bit of UX going on, but um, for the yellow, yellow slides, those will be the, the headers like this one, right? So that's yellow, that's kind of important. And the next level down uh, will be the pink slides, which will be the start point. And for the green ones, don't worry about it. Maybe, maybe it's just there to entertain you, right? So the very first step is to understand, understand purpose, to understand others, and to understand the cost of not doing it 
uh, not going with purpose. So I think a very big question is, what is your ultimate purpose? What makes you come alive? Um, one version of that is, what would you do for free? If you are an organization, um, what is success? And uh, another version for an organization is, what if your budgets run out? Will you still pursue that? I've been in an organization where I was hired to do a certain thing. And about a few months later, they said, I'm sorry, the budget's run out. We're going to be doing something else. So I, I can understand why some, certain organizations would just pivot according to where the needs are. But if you were truly clear of what your purpose was, would you still fight for it? Because there's going to be so much opposition to if, if you've got purpose, you know, in your job, in life, it is bound to face lots of opposition. So there's some, some problems, I, some, some opposition I face when, when, I, when I come, when I ask a question like that, um, say in a boardroom would be stop asking such existential question. You know, we'll just go round and round and we won't land. And, but that's precisely the point that people haven't aligned to a common understanding of purpose that really um, pulls organizations apart. There isn't a common language. Another, um, another barrier to, to, to asking this question is, is, is if you care more about what others think about you rather than being, bring, being self-aware, I guess. So, um, yeah, in an organization, you know, we, we, we know, we hear about silos. Very rarely do we see silos in our day-to-day -to -day lives, actually. Um, and we get different versions, right? So one, one, one aspect of an organization may go, yep, let's aim for good. Let's aim for better or best. Um, some, if that's a department, could just flatly, outrightly say, no, we're not doing that. Um, in Singapore, there's a real mentality of just do it, you know, don't think, just do. And um, that's something that, that can prevent you from, from arriving at success. Uh, many people are very tentative. Uh, if you've ever tried to get RSVPs for a party or RSVPs for a Zoom call, you know, there's, there's always this behavior of trying to see what the next best option is and I'll, and I'll just hop there. And then you get people who are completely lost, who, who, who we don't know why, why they show up to work sometimes, right? So uh, there's many versions of that. And I think something that, uh, that happens is that there's often a tension. So the heart represents, you know, um, the emotions, people who really think about the experience and feelings. And then the head, you know, it's the cerebral intellectual viewpoint where it's about sometimes the philosophy of things and the hands represent a really operational engineering can do blood and sweat uh, mindset. And very often these are key things that are at odds with each other. And I would like to, to suggest that tension is actually healthy because like your own body, we're made of so many different parts um, that, you know, this, this unity is actually really crucial to, to functioning well. But somehow, we, many, many of us um, are not able to grow up enough to understand that we're all different and uh, that it's okay to have tension in order to move forward. So, so even acknowledging this, you know, as remember, we're, we're in the first step of understanding. We need to understand that not all forces are opposing each other, and that takes a bit of maturity. Now, I'd like to ask you about this guy. You know, feel free to unmute yourself, right, if you want to participate. Um, it gets a bit, it gets a bit boring hearing my own voice. <laughs> and um, so, who's this guy? What does he like, dislike, need, or want? Where is he from? Any, 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 anyone dare to to be vulnerable in a in a, in, a, in a small Zoom chat of 50. Or you can, you can put it in the chat too. I, I, I can actually see my chat. Any guesses? Like what, what, what does this guy like? 
what does he do for work? Oh no, I think I've put everyone to sleep. <laughs> Just ask him. Fashion design student, investment banker, designer, nomad. What does he like? Likes fashion, dislikes structure, developer, artist, musician. Fair enough. He needs love. Hipster from Brooklyn. All right, I'll, 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 you can keep going. <laughs> so this is him. お前のね。ほら。話題の情報、ニュースなでこれ。何でも捉え。褒められたいの添島純です。よろしくお願いします。今回ですね、あの、僕添島なんと、そうですね。そうですね。そうですね。そうですね。そうですね。そうですね。そ
you know what, it doesn't really matter which is good design because it depends on who you're designing for, right? This visually may look more pleasing, uh, but, but really the point isn't about how it looks, right? It's about who you're actually serving. So, and then getting to the root cause of problems, right? So if you if you got rid of the smoke in this situation, would you have solved the problem? If you got rid of the fire, would you have solved the problem? If this was Hong Kong, and you got rid of the smoke and the fire, um, right? You wouldn't have got rid of the root cause of a problem. So definitely, uh, this is what really understanding uh, a situation, uh, the context is. And then to consider the cost of not following your purpose, of not trusting your gut, of not listening to advice or not following your passions. What really is the cost? Um, that is something that uh, got a little um, model, right? And there is a lot of research about this. So when, when you don't do what you know you should be doing, uh, you come under more stress and cortisol is a hormone that's created um, that, uh, that sort of helps you with your fight or flight reflex. And that's what keeps you alive. But when you have such high stress levels on a constant basis, your immunity drops. And when your immunity drops, you can only imagine what happens to your body over time. And so this is um, something that uh, we see a lot of evidence of um, and, and please go and look into this, All right? So just to sum up, it's really important to understand uh, as much as you can, really what is the purpose of where you're at, whether you're an individual or an organization, uh, learn to listen actively and understand the cost of not doing so. And um, well, the next step is to analyze what you've collected or what you've understood in order to get really clear. So just as an example, um, Google has well, 36 apps for consumers here, another 30, and then on the enterprise side, they've got more apps. And yet when you go to Google, this is what you think of. What we tend to do um, is we try to please, when you try to please everyone, you end up creating the Swiss army knife on the left, right? And this is a real manifestation of not knowing your purpose, of being dragged in every direction by all your stakeholders. So I think here's another point about design where, yes, we, are, we serve users, we're user-centric, but we, we, we also have a vision and a purpose. So um, I struggle to think how, you know, um, this, I wouldn't even call it a pocket knife. Uh, and, you know, uh, if you think about certain situations where we're trying so hard to please everyone, you just can't please everyone. You need to know what your purpose is. I, I think there's so much I could draw out of this uh, image, but I'm gonna just keep moving. If we wanna talk about this later, we can. So, which leads me to my point that you can actually say no to things and, and, and um, that's actually quite difficult because if, if you don't know what your purpose is, then um, it, it's about prioritizing uh, what's more important. So when you, let's say you've, you've found out all the information you need about a certain problem, now you can decide what's important and what isn't. There's so many distractions today. Um, and you know, um, how many fires are are, constant, are you constantly fighting? In in this sense, if you knew what your priorities were or are, um, then you'd know what to be brave about, where the battles are really worth fighting, and by 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 going into that battle, you can you you actually have a good sense of um, getting towards success, right? Whatever that that definition is for you, so. Really, we, we need to learn to prioritize information and really to know where it starts and where it stops. When does it end? So something I personally struggle with is with empathy. 
firstly, it's hard to say no to people. And it's also hard to know when to stop something. And when you're leading a team, you need to know when things start and stop because it gets really tiring very far, very fast. Um, well, the third step, you know, it's funny saying that this is design, but the point is really about guiding others and, and helping them to know what's ahead. And this is some, uh, something someone said to me uh, very recently on Monday, I heard this, to be clear is to be kind. And basically it means that when you take the effort to bring clarity, others will understand your intent. There isn't, you know, uh, miscommunication happening. And this applies to almost any relationship. When you're unclear, you, let, you leave people guessing and trying to predict behavior. And when you see things clearly, it is your responsibility to develop a language to help others to see clearly too. And so this is something very fresh for me. And, I, and when, when, when I heard this, it just really made sense. And this is something um, I learned um, when we were, we were designing systems for people who had been abused at home and were going through a service uh, you know, through, through the government um, to apply for per personal protection orders. So people who had been abused. And when they didn't know what was ahead, um, they would face a lot of unnecessary anxiety. And when you don't know what's ahead and you're anxious, you can't make a good decision. That's uh, something that has really stuck with me um, throughout, uh, ever since I, 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 we, we came across this insight. And um, yeah, you know, said that that has so many implications for whether you're making a decision, a life decision, or a decision on which color your 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 you know if you're buying a car, what what color it needs to be, you know, how do you actually make that decision? Well, at least try not to be anxious, right? And if you're designing the system, don't make people anxious. We almost need progress bars in life just to let you know where you are exactly. Um, that would be helpful sometimes so that you know it's not a, a rope that just keeps you know pulling and, and doesn't end and as humans we actually can't manage more than five choices at once there's a whole psychology around this if you look at e-commerce they generally try to keep uh, not more than five items in a row uh, although they do try to push the limits you know i'm sure there's pressure from management to, to push in to squeeze in a few more options Unless you're on a Chinese e-commerce website where well, they'll just hammer you with a hundred items at once. And again, is that good design? It depends on the user. Some people love it. But we can't e evaluate more than five choices or around five choices at once. If you think about buying, let's say, an iPad that had different features, um, you know, uh, yeah, more than five apparently doesn't work. But why then do we have 7 billion results coming up when we type in Google? Why do we try to produce unlimited permutations and unlimited levels of customization for people? And why, and, you know, and, and I think this can lead to a paralysis, the analysis that leads to paralysis of too many choices, right? So to make an effective decision, sometimes you just have to filter it out. There's many words for this in UX, but I'll, I'll, I'll avoid those words for now. And one key part in the design process is about building trust. When you have the ability or when you're in a position of, of planning out something, um, really at the, the, un, the, the foundation of it is about consistency. And about if, you're, if, you're, if you're wanting to see progress and, and, and moving forward, um, there has to be a certain consistent, consistency, like a muscle memory or strengthening a muscle. When you um, allow too many exceptions, um, it results in a broken system. If, uh, you know, in, in the airline industry, um, we get, uh, you get callers who once heard that, oh, this person got a $500 uh, uh, refund for, for this circumstance. And so they'll try to game the system with these exceptions. We, we see that when businesses try to, to give lots of promotions and discounts, consumers become dependent on that and won't actually pay for something in future. 
So, I mean, again, there's many things to be said here. Uh, um, I'm keen to know what this would mean to you. And so to, to sum up the third out of, okay, so there's three out of four, four steps, right? Um, that we design to guide others and to build trust. If you want to see it work in, in the long term and be sustainable. And finally, step four is really about validating. Um, and this is about feedback. It's about being uh, vulnerable and humble enough to, to, to be wrong. To simply ask, how am I doing? How is it going? And to have this attitude. This attitude can be reflected in a system. Uh, it, can, it can be a support structure around you in, in community to have friends that tell you how you're going. And, and it's this whole approach of being humble and to keep learning. However, there's a lot of inertia. Um, these days, I'm so used to working from home, I don't want to go out at all. Um, so what is it going to take to translate that feedback into action? And this is a fundamental issue uh, where, you know, when, when, when you hear about certain um, horror stories. Um, I mean, I was just thinking of a, a recent show I watched on Netflix about Athlete A, where, where there was a gymnastics uh, sports doctor who, who abused more than 500 athletes. And no action was taken over so many years. You know, so, so I think um, there needs to be a responsiveness to to, to, to feedback and acting upon it and not being complacent. So a bias towards action, right? And so, so that's step four, which is to really to validate and to listen and, and, and to act on it. So to sum up what I've just um, shared, you know, there's just four steps. Um, there's many ways to, and, and different models, but you know, it, it, does, it does seem to fit in, into this. Uh, these four steps of understanding purpose really and going with it, analyzing um, and, and weighing up what the priorities are in order to, you know, be able to say no and to say yes to, to, to certain battles that you're going to pick and then designing a way forward that uh, enables either yourself or the people you're designing for to know how you're doing, to know what's ahead and to do it in a consistent manner. And finally, to really um, have a support structure that helps you, that keeps you humble and vulnerable. And so, so those are the, really the four, the four steps. Um, at this point, I just, I was gonna, this looks like a wedding invite. Uh, but um, <laughs> I'm just thinking of whether we should do this in a month. If that's too soon, maybe two months. It, it does take a lot of work to, you know, to, to, to bring, to make, to simplify things. So we'll do that mean, but that, that's a tentative date that I'm thinking. And so, Tamsin, would you like to weigh in on, 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 I need a more neutral background. Yeah, so let's keep it at this. <laughs> at this, and then I'll just stop sharing for a while. Actually, oh. I think it'd be really lovely to hear what resonates. I, I loved all of that, Ruben. Thank you so much. I guess it's interesting to hear, uh, or even see everyone's face. You know, what? I'm a real meanie because I'm also an ex-university lecturer. I love to see people in the room. It's I very do, weird. I do, I do. I just Show us your to, faces. Uh, thank you, thank you. So much hey. nicer. <laughs> okay. It's like otherwise when you're teaching a class and they're all asleep. <laughs> uh, Yay, hello everyone. Hey. <laughs> so cool. I think it would be really interesting to see what resonated in all of that amongst, amongst everyone because I think um, I, I can share very, very briefly for me that the very first um, aspect that you're sharing in terms of understanding everything I've always done I've, I've, I've pitched around the impact I'm trying to create so having that purpose is such a powerful tool because when you and your team and your other stakeholders are aligned around a shared vision purpose or, or impact you want to make you might have different journeys towards it but you know that you're all aligned in terms of where you're going. And, and I tell you, you've used the word transformation a few times. When we design things, we're looking to create a change. 
And there's a weird thing about human beings. We hate change. You know? <laughs> so that's what I don't know why we're so bad at dealing with change. But what I found to be a very powerful tool is when we're aligned around that purpose and where we're heading, it makes it much easier for us to come together and work together towards change. So I think from everything you've shared, that first bit is so critical. When we can come together around the desired impact, the purpose that's fueling us, it allows us to overcome things because change is really, really hard. Yeah, it can feel exhausting. And sometimes, again, it can feel like everyone hates you and everyone is against you and you want to lie on the floor crying and give up. Yeah, you have this great idea and no one's helping you. I've been there many times. <laughs> but when you're all aligned around the something bigger, it enables you to find a way forward. So it would be interesting to hear what other people felt resonated with them, I guess, as well. Thank you for that, Ruben, anyway, for sharing. Oh, pleasure, pleasure. I mean, some calls, everyone claps like this so that they don't have to find their buttons. With gas hands, right? <laughs> I think uh, just to share a bit of the difficulty of uh, Wednesday, <laughs> um, a, bit, a bit of the complexity of what, what, what we just spoke about. So there, there's maybe even up to 20% of the people who registered who have recently lost their jobs in, in the COVID period. There's people who are struggling with personal issues. There are others who have just graduated and are looking for work. There are others in toxic work environments, others who are very product focused, um, UX product uh, owners, managers in a tech space, and others who have maybe more existential philosophical questions. And so I think it was very difficult to bring all of that together in, in without jargon because it's so specific to the context and so i was trying you know and, and the if, if i reduce everything it just becomes like you know too too simplistic so so that that's what i was trying to to balance out but i still believe that fundamentally it's about serving others and and, and really knowing your purpose if i had to bring it down sum it up in, in in two words and if you bring that into a product space if you bring that into into your career path and what would you do for free even if no one paid you I think that can result in transformation and, and, and change. So just happy to hear. We're gonna we're gonna take a risk because you know Zoom is all about security now. But um, we're gonna take a risk and, and see if anyone wants to, yeah, just just reflect on 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 what what we just spoke about. Anyone? Can I? Okay. Hey, Dave. Hey, Ruben. Hey. I, I almost had tears in my eyes, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, um, <clears throat> for the rest of you, I've known Ruben for a very long time. And, um, wow, his, his uh, design, I remember when he designed the pen, and I was just, I was just so impressed. I was like, wow. And I've got a Starforce startup company, and I recently thought I really need some design work done. And I was like, oh, I remember Ruben. I, have, I live in Sydney. He's in Singapore, it's been a very long time. But what I'm really interested in is how do you get people, you know, you say get understanding, and maybe this is for the next lecture. How do you get honest feedback? You know, so often I ask somebody, you know, how do you like that dashboard? My product does dashboards. And they're like, awesome, man. It's just awesome. <laughs> and then they go and buy another product. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> you know, so, I try really to, I mean, everything you said was just so spot on, but like the next level is going to be also just how do you get understanding from people? How do you really get to know? And especially now, like all my customers are distributed around the world and I'm sitting here at home sort of supporting them over Zoom and uh, not in their office, you know, across the conference table, reading their body language, and seeing the kind of look on their face and that sort of thing. Anyway, that's that's my feedback. Yeah. Um I'll try not to, you know, take too much of the uh, of the time. I'd love to hear others too, but I think in, in general that 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 that's uh one of the ongoing difficulties we will face. Um especially if we if we are in a remote sort of position where you're not actually with a person we lose so much of the body cues. Like if, if 70% of communication happens through our body language and you don't put your video on, no, 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 we're not judging the rest of the, 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 
<laughs> the participants, but um, it's really hard to tell um, because what people say and what they think can often be very different things. How often do you exercise in a week? Sometimes you just hear their aspirations. And so um, what we often do, which is really painstaking and not, uh, not highly valued enough, uh, sometimes good chats with people um, you know, with, 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 with work, we, we, it's hard to generalize, right? But, um, when you talk about interviews with people, if you get them to just really share their experiences and their stories, it could take two hours of your time and which business can afford two hours for every customer. Right. And yet, um, it's, it, it, there's also an art to listening and, and putting different pieces of information to look at the patterns of what they are saying, what they're not saying. Uh, and bringing it together, and that is really time consuming but but that's also where we get the insights that are actually actionable and um it it, it takes years to to really know that well i I don't want to under understate how difficult it is, so maybe a, a short answer would be a qualitative and a quantitative um, approach as much data as you can, whether it's directly from the person and other metrics that you can embed in the system usage, you know, um, then there's data science, you know, get a really good data scientist, not just any data scientist. <laughs> so, 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 um, yeah, I, I don't know if that's too, too general an answer. I think if, if I can jump in on this a little as well, it's definitely about triangulating your sources of data. So you'll get some quant kind of feedback. People are rubbish at giving feedback. Yeah, we're not designed to. And in, in every cult, culture or every country, there's a different approach to it. it. It took me off guard when I first moved to Singapore and kept getting this really blunt feedback. And I thought, oh my goodness, everyone hates me. Actually, it's just that we have a, a, a different kind of feedback culture here compared to the one in the UK, where they're more like, say, yeah, 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 this is awesome. And then behind my back say, what she's doing is rubbish. So <laughs> very different experiences in terms of the way people give feedback. One of the simple tools that we use in some of our programs is to, to say to people, I want to force you to find one thing you like about this. And if you really can't tell me why, I want to force you to tell me one thing you think should be improved, one thing you don't like about this. And then if you were being really wild, is there anything that you do to improve it? It's a very simple, structured way of drawing some of that out. It's not perfect, it's a bit crude, but it forces them to think about a bit more of a balanced view rather than a very flat view. And it can engage in the conversation. But I think as Ruben said, the observational piece is really critical because we often say one thing and, and do another. Yeah, we can subliminally be trying our cat's cat food before we serve the cat the food, but you would never ask them the question, do you sample your cat's cat food before you serve it? But apparently, yes, many cat owners eat their cat's food. So this is a random <laughs> aside, but it means we need to look at multiple, multiple data sources. Yeah, because <laughs> that can and, tell us a lot about people. <laughs> and if you're running a global product, um, you know how you ask questions can be perceived very differently so if i were to consider the asian version of good versus maybe a more western literal understanding of what good means if you were to have a scale of things i mean i found that most people will never give a perfect score in asia very rarely right so this is again a, a blanket statement we do get perfect scores every now and then but there's this almost perfectionist where nothing is perfect so i can never give it a, a 10 out of 10 and if something is really bad why is it that nothing goes below a five on a scale of one to ten well because i don't want to make them feel bad so five becomes you know and, and so there are different ways to, to to work with that um with, with with statistics and mathematics but but suddenly if you apply that to a global audience and people are giving you twos people maybe asian people are giving only up to a five in terms of the lowest end you know so that that, that that's yeah complexity right there does anyone uh, else want to weigh in on anything that sort of stood out to you hey ruben i got a question hey, yeah um 
Hey, Ted. About, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you mentioned about culture, and I absolutely agree that it really starts with a, a strong culture. If you got a poor culture, then it's difficult to get things done. Uh, but my, from my experience, I think culture needs to be uh, driven top down. I mean, the, the, the senior leadership absolutely a particular culture uh, top down. But if, if your senior leadership doesn't have the same viewpoints of, of building the right culture, do you see it's possible to develop a culture bottom up? I mean, is that something that is, is even possible? So to personally, to um, the ground? I, I, I have failed personally to, to see that happen. I've tried, uh, there was, um, so a personal experience where I tried something for eight years and, and, and I really gave it a shot and um, we, we saw different leaders coming in and going out and ultimately it stems from the top. If you want to see certain changes, I, I know, I hope, I hope that's not too uh, skeptical, um, you know, um, I, I think it's both. It takes two hands to clap. Uh, but you do need inspiring leaders to, to the lead. The bigger the team is, uh, it needs to be directed. So I think there's a fine line where we are data driven and logical and pragmatic and answering to lots of stakeholders. But I cannot under, uh, understate how important leadership is because it's back to purpose. Because, because it's going to be about battles. You can't get through life without a few scrapes and, and, and failures and accidents, and it's going to take that level of vision to, to really push through. And so there, there are going to be times where a, such a leader needs to push through past data points that don't make sense or that are telling you to do otherwise. And then it gets exciting. Look at your own lives. Everyone's got enough color and you, you can't, there's not enough data or there's too much data that will just make it confusing. So, so, um, we're actually, I'm actually on a project to, to review 25 large organizations in Singapore at the moment. And it's so clear that um, we, we need strong leaders, just leaders who, are, who, who can manage, uh, can, who can use data to make decisions, but also have a clear sense of, of, of vision and purpose such that they are not, they are not only looking at KPIs, not only looking at um, expectations on them, but they have a, they also carry a vision that outweighs um, what they're told to do by boards. So I don't know if I'm going off, you know, beyond what our, our current conversation is, but but it's it's so real to me right now. We're in so many situations where the findings from our understanding phase can result in these CEOs being replaced. So it's it's it, that's a high consequence to to under, having a very strong handle on, on how, how important this topic is. So we've been you know, hired by boards to, to look into organizations. And often, if, you know, if it's really, it, 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 it's the leader's responsible, responsibility ultimately. Yeah, maybe that's the simplest way I could have answered your question. In terms of responsibilities, it is a leader's responsibility. You can do what you can from the ground up because it takes two hands to clap, but it has to be initiated from the top. I'm happy to jump in again, but just to say <laughs> it's very, it's very, very hard when you have leadership that don't get it. Yeah, I know, and I've been in situations like that. Um, having said that, I've also been in situations where I was able to influence huge global corporations at the highest level who thought. Um, the approach I was proposing was irrelevant to them. It's again about using this, this um, understanding of what matters to that leadership. Yeah, for the CEO, for the, for the person in charge, what is it that's motivating them? If you go in pushing your agenda, it's unlikely that they're interested. If you go in using your language, so sometimes my big bugbear where my big bugbear with designers is they use designer speak. And sometimes people aren't ready for designer speak. Yeah, they want to know about what matters to me. So sometimes we have to take a roundabout journey. I managed to use a human-centered design-led approach on one of the biggest civil engineering projects in the UK that was mired in protest and controversy 
without once referring to human-centered design. We snuck it in and it informed everything the entire 5,000 man project was doing, but none of them knew they were doing that. And it was only at the end they said, wow, this communications approach was really effective. And I was like, uh-huh. And we, were managed, we managed to influence all of the leadership team and all our subcontractors and leadership teams to do things in a very different way without explicitly telling them we needed them to do this. So they're focused on the results. So it's, some organizations are extremely tough and trust me, I know I've been there and I have the battle wounds. But again, if we can use some of that thinking, understanding why they're doing what they're doing, what pressures are on them and their motivations, it can sometimes help us to bridge the gap and start to get some traction. But as Ruben said, it, it, KPIs matter also, yeah? We can go in with an idealistic view, but at the top level, we're being judged on certain things. So when we understand what they're being judged on, what their pressures are, it can sometimes help us to pitch what we're proposing in a different way. So think about the users at every level. Yeah, I think um, a, a simple litmus test is if you ask someone, what are you actually afraid of? You know, that's a real, a really, a really uh, difficult question to answer. What are you afraid to lose? And what, what, what keeps you awake at night? And if a leader is not aware of what he's afraid of, or if he's afraid of everything, then you're going to have a very reactive leader who will just jump from one from one vine to another and it would be incapable of really leading a team effectively because it's reactive leadership so um but yeah you know i think one thing we learned from from working in the legal system is that um when when someone is in fear it's very difficult to design a solution for them because it's very illogical and um, irrational. So if you have a leader in that position, then it's potentially a very toxic situation because you're, you'll be spending a lot of time trying to predict what that person wants and you, how are you gonna get any good work done? Strategic decisions, you know, you spend all that time overcoming yourself rather than actually getting out there and building something that's really good. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks, John. That's Thank good. Thank you, Jackie, with a question. If that's sure. Okay. Thank you for your sharing, Ruben, as well, and Hampton as well. Um, I just had a quick question on how you guys will actually build alignment, I think, in a situation where there's a lot of different diverse voices, or even a situation where it's quite complex, especially, I think, in healthcare systems, for example. So if you have any practical tips as well that you share in terms of how you go about doing that, um, both in terms of building alignment and, I guess, disseminating that across all levels of stakeholders. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to go first, Tamsin? Or... Thank you, Shelley. Thank you so much. I think it's a common one I find. I've worked a lot in healthcare and the social service sector. Uh, and sometimes in healthcare, because of the nature of the acute side of healthcare, sometimes it ironically feels that people are working in slightly different directions. I'll give you a very quick example. I was working with a team of nurses in one of our restructured hospitals and um, they were under a lot of pressure to be more productive. Yeah, productivity is key. We don't have, in particular, like, we don't have the resources or the manpower to deliver what's required. There's also the pressure around increasingly patient-centered care. And how do you do that when you're already understaffed and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the nurse, nurses came to me very dutifully saying, we want to understand design thinking so we can start to design solutions that will make us more productive. And I had to calm them down and say, hang on a minute, we understand management. In fact, why do management care about productivity KPIs? Because MOH cares about productivity KPIs. And that all logically makes sense. Then when we step it back, I said to the nurses, can I just ask you why you went into nursing? And then they smiled and they said, well, I went into nursing to, to care for people. I said, yeah, to care for patients. They said, yes. And then they, they got misty eyed and talked about some of the lovely stories of where they'd really been able to be at the bedside and care and bring these wonderful impacts to people's lives. And I asked them, how much time of the day do you spend caring, really caring for patients? And they said 10%. The majority of my day is spent at the computer filling in details, yeah, or pouring beverages or doing food orders or doing this. They said, I get very little time with my patients. I said, so productivity is actually the tool 
that will free up your time to spend more time with your patients. When they reframed it, there was alignment. They were aligning with what ministry wanted, with what management wanted, but also it aligned with their purpose. I want to care for my patients. And then they were inspired. It wasn't like an onerous duty. It was something I'm compelled and passionate about trying to solve. And I couldn't stop them. Wonderful. They're still carrying away now. So I always encourage people to really break down and try and reframe the challenge they're looking at. In Singapore in particular, people are really good at being dutiful. Yeah, I'm told to do this, so I must do it. But actually, just because you're told to do something doesn't mean it can't work for you. So try to find that thing that motivates you. So I always, I genuinely believe if we push back far enough, we can find that win-win sweet spot. I, I know it's there because even when I've walked into projects, that I myself have thought, oh my goodness, this is impossible, I can't do it. We've worked through that different stakeholder groups till we've reached that sweet spot where we found this is the win-win, yeah. We all care about having a productive healthcare system because for all our different motivations, it's achieving the same end goal. So it requires a bit of effort, but I personally believe you can delve deep and find that connection point. And that kind of becomes your desired mission, yeah, your impact, the purpose as to why you're there. And then you will know you have a different pathway to get there, but you're aligned in, in getting there. So I don't know if that helps, but that to me was an, an example that was very easy to visualize in a complex system. Hmm. Ruben will have more structured advice. <laughs> I, I, I'm afraid, you know, alignment is, 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 a, is a very personal thing uh, in, in different um, situations. Uh, consider going into a family business and aligning uh, the, the patriarch or the matriarch of the family who has been leading the business for 30 years. And then you've got another generation of managers who are, who are relatives trying, you're trying to bring a, uh, alignment between generations, different personalities, different worldviews. Um, some leaders do not understand technology and data, you know, and so there, there's, I think it, it can come down to identifying what what is really causing the rift uh, in alignment. In certain in certain cases, we need to break down the complexity. Otherwise, you'll never be able to eat the whole elephant, right? You've got to also chip away at it. So, so to John's point, you know, about small steps um, are just as important as uh, some bigger, high-level decision-making. Um, but unfortunately, the way most organizations are structured, you know, when the person at the top gets a certain revelation, suddenly the whole organization is moving in this direction. It's like, I saw a charity in Israel and, and they do this. Let's go and do this now. And suddenly our whole organization is just keeping up with this guy. And then he goes to a conference, you know, he goes to CES or something and then it gets inspired. All right, we're all AI and we're data driven from tomorrow onwards. Hang on, guys. You know, and uh, over time, everyone in, in this organization builds really big forearms just from hanging on for dear life over time. You get survivors and it built a uh, just, just in Singapore, it's just doula. You know, it's just, 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 just survive. And, and that mindset is toxic because it will not survive the next challenges ahead. You have to think ahead. And, and, and so I think alignment is not just a workshop. Alignment is a day-to-day -day cultural trait. That, because again, back to the, the original intent or, or reason why we're talking about this today, it's because it, it's not a product. It's not, it's not something as a consultant I can bring in and wave a magic wand. It, it, it's, 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 it's everything. If you break down the components of culture, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just going to give you 10 points now. So, so uh, Singy is laughing. And this is not to be academic, but really if, you, if we would, we've, we've broken culture down into 10 components, right? So the first four come from a McKinsey model, which is leadership, structure, process, and product, right? So those are the very mechanical bits. Leaders, you can bring in and out, but within leadership, that, that, that means so much. Within structure, how you're structured for collaboration or not structured for collaboration and whether people feel safe. Within processes, are they efficient or are they completely manual and wearing people out? And within your product, is it, is it, is it, um, 
yeah, I, I won't describe product, right? So product and, and whatever your organization creates. And then be, behind that, the soft stuff that people tend to shy away from, especially the numbers people, uh, you've got your values, you've got your identity. If I understand that everyone has, has encountered some form of trauma in your life, right? If someone in school by the name of Jeremy bullied you and another Jeremy shows up at your work, it can be as simple as that. That, that, that can be a trigger, right? Um, so your, your values, your identity, your skills and your mindset or your capabilities. Um, you know, if you don't know how to do something, there's a chance that you might shy away from going near to that topic or territory because it's very vulnerable. Um, then there's the sense of psychological safety. Uh, and that is, that is a, that, that's, that's the enemy. Trying to get to psychological safety in any organization, in any sphere, to be vulnerable and to, to, to feel that you can just say what you need to say without being judged or condemned and being cast aside, right? Uh, the context, right? We were in a COVID era. Uh, we are looking at an economy that's not doing too well. So there are certain hard stops with, with, with that. And then communication is probably the most important one as well. I'm not sure if I went through 10, but um, yeah, communication. I, I struggle, like I've sometimes got too many thoughts in my head and by the time I try to squeeze them into a, into a packaged sentence, it doesn't make sense. So, so it's an ongoing, I think too much, right? So, so yeah, um, if you took those 10 things and worked on all of them, there's, a, there's still a high chance we could still not be getting to alignment. So, so it's, it's a daily uh, discipline, you know, as if you're in a leadership position, is to be intentional, the communication, to be vulnerable, you know, to, to, to serve the people that you lead. Um, yeah, I, I don't know where to start, really. It, it, it's a very big uh, conversation. Um, you know, maybe we could, we, could, we could shortlist a couple of topics to talk about and, and see where that goes. Because I don't think we have answers. I think I'm very clear about that. But we have an attitude. So that, 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 that's all we've got sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> some skills and, 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 and if enough attitude and you just get it done. I, I don't think you can over, you can't, you, you can't make this an academic exercise. These frameworks can be the enemy as well. If you try to fit your whole problem into a framework, you're asking for trouble because you, you would have delivered a really nice report maybe at the end of it, but it's not going to change anything. And that's an enemy as well. Many enemies, right? That we want to, sorry, I was just, I was just processing out loud. So there's a lot to, to think about. Yeah. yeah, I mean, when is a job well done? If you're, if you're looking at your situation, when would, it, when would you actually get to success? If, it's, if, if, if alignment is a day-to-day -day thing, you don't actually arrive, right? And, and, and maybe confidence is another thing. Like just a can-do, can-do spirit. You just need to be gung-ho sometimes and just be a bit foolish and hungry and I don't know, I'm still trying trying that. I, I don't really know what we're doing with this session in a sense, just putting out there what we know, what we care about, and we'll just see what happens, you know? Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> maybe, maybe for subsequent calls, the rule will be that everyone has to put their video on. <laughs> so all the people with video are laughing and saying yes. <laughs> yeah, I might be afraid what we might see though. What we <laughs> Yeah, at least put on a shirt. At the very least. <laughs> any any thoughts from anyone? Even maybe one anyone who's not on video, uh, we we don't mind. Sorry to make fun of you. No? Um I've actually got a little link uh for feedback but I wanted to maybe I'll just share my screen please jump in at any point because we're just we're just um, sharing now but I do I do have a, a final slide for you to think about um, I don't think it's practical to um, to um, to do a breakout group now um, but there are four questions on the side that um, might be helpful to some of you um, and the first is about 
where have you had certain wins in your life? Um, things that you're naturally good at, an area that you have influence in. Um, and, you know, look, there's no right or wrong to this. Because what we're trying to get to is where do you have a measure of authority? Where's your playing field? Where's your credibility? And what, what really makes you come alive? That, that should be fairly closely linked. And if we start narrowing down into then what kind of problems uh, do you like to solve? Um, I, I can send this out to everyone as well. Um, you know, this and, and, and the summary of what, what I shared. Um, and, and finally, it, it's about if you can think beyond yourself, who you're actually looking to serve, um, that would be really helpful you know, in, in setting some basic directions. Because if there are certain groups that you're pretty sure you're not going to serve, then you shouldn't be in that space. Um, so um, I, I think on this point, you know, the word social impact is used a lot, but it often represents certain industries or nonprofit uh, sectors. And um, it's important that social impact it's, it's just part of culture, wherever you are, whether it's in a boardroom, a workplace, or, you know, um, yeah, because to me, we, 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 we need to have less toxic places and environments in general. So, so I don't think um, healthcare should own social impact or charities should own social impact. I think it's for all. We need to de democratize social impact. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, sorry, a bit of preaching going on there. So uh, you can screenshot this. I can, I can, I can create slides. I don't know. Um, should I like you know send out like PDFs of what I? I don't know because there, there are not many words on my slides usually. So I've had students who've gone like, come on, please give us something that we can actually read. You have two words on your slides at a time, and so a bit aware of that. Um, it's eleven thirty. Um, if you any guys, uh, anyone wants to hang around, I'm happy to, to to chat a bit further. But you know, thank thanks so much for your time. But, uh, thanks, Tamsin, Elias, and Singy for 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 being sort of moderators. I didn't know what to expect. My Zoom account takes a hundred people, so I was a bit nervous. Um, but hey, we had a fifty percent show up rate, so I think, uh, yeah, that that's thanks, Ruben. That was awesome. Yeah. My pleasure. Thanks, Tamsin, yeah. as well really valuable time spent, I'd say. I'm, gr I'm glad, I'm glad. Thanks, Ruben. Uh, hey, learned that, a lot today, amazing. so uh, uh, look, yeah, <laughs> looking forward to the next session, man. Whoa, no pressure. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what we'll talk about. <laughs>
you know, it's just it's not easy. So I think I think we did. Pretty, I'm I'm pretty pleased with with how yeah, it, how it, it turned really out. Yeah, it's pretty good. Loved it. <laughs> Thank you that. Hi, guys. Well, can you hear me? Hi. Yes, hi, Corinne. Hi. Hi, <laughs> hi guys. Uh, really good job there, I think. Um, it's very clear. I mean, it's a bit quieter than most of the workshops that I've attended, especially from the global, um, from US, I think. But I, I think <laughs> because the group is really big, but I think anything under like 10, I think you probably can have breakout sessions and more people trying to engage. And I think the chats are fine once you've got a couple of people like, start the ball rolling people will probably chip in and you know put in their comments so really good job guys i think uh um looking forward to more i think earlier you talked about tension and culture and um people and leaders i think that's that's uh quite quite important i think in organizations and uh, companies these days because obviously in singapore it's a melting pot um and you've got both a good mix of locals asians uh versus those asians who are a little bit more westernized and also you know westernized westerners so um and you've got also i've also worked with like westerners who think like asians so i think the challenge moving forward is like you know how do leaders or how do you even approach you know leaders who can recognize a problem in the organization but how do you even start that first step of, you know, getting people to even open up and be honest about, you know, what's wrong with the organization? Um, yeah, yeah, and giving honest feedback really is, is what you're after, isn't it? Yeah, honesty, how do you get to honesty? Is, you know, in, in, sometimes it's drinks that bring out honesty, you know, um, in Japan to get, to get, you know, coworkers to really tell you the truth. Um, yeah, it, it, it comes out when, when, when people get a bit drunk. So, but surely there are, there, there, are, there are other ways as well. Can't, you can't only have one weapon when you're going into war. So, um, how, do you, uh, how do you get the honesty? Yeah, the favorite old alcohol trust juice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although often also used in change management terms. So, like, how do we lower your barriers so that you'll listen? Um, so it needn't be alcohol, but I think it's again, it's about it's just connecting to human beings on a human level. We listen to facts after we've connected on an emotional level to anything. So that's why I'm saying people and engaging on a human level first is so important before we get to business, as it were. So whether it's alcohol or <laughs> when I worked in a very big civil engineering project before I left the UK, I would give over every single Friday afternoon to just eating cakes and drinking coffee the whole afternoon. And I would bring in, it was a very, very large project. I would bring in the section heads of each part of the site, along with the highways engineer, the, the traffic manager, various different people would all come together. And they came because it was the end of the week and I had really good coffee and really good cakes that I brought every week. So it was a social element and we would chat and then we would get down to business terms, right? What's coming up over the next few weeks? And we would look for those potential friction points and we would communally design around that then I would meet with the next section head and I could bring that insight into the next meeting everyone came in a very positive frame of mind because we weren't coming together to solve problems we were coming together to drink really good coffee which on a construction site is hard to find let me tell you and eat cake and it eased us into the weekend feeling good and feeling we'd resolve things so we went from being the project that was the most hated in the UK to being one that completely flipped the narrative that had articles written about it in terms of how it transformed perception and reputation the queen came to open the project and said it was something that had transformed thousands of people's lives etc etc it went it went from being rock bottom and i believe coffee cake and chat was a large part of that yeah <laughs> so yeah alcohol also can <laughs> awesome yeah who doesn't want a good coffee and um good cup of coffee and cake ah. <laughs> So Elias knows this. Every morning when we meet, I'm there with my coffee. Lucky we don't have meetings at night. <laughs> <laughs> the true serum comes out. Yeah. Um, I think a parting shot would be, um, you know, if you have leaders who have never failed before, then it's very hard to get an honest conversation because they wouldn't be able to empathize with what happens on the ground. Um, but someone who is who's able to face failure 
and 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 pick themselves up i think would generally you know naturally i i if i if i were to step back and sort of observe um you know some for 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 some overachievers they find it hard to to actually open up and and for those who who are good with coping with you know who have faced failure before um, you know having been to the bottom i think you naturally become more humble knowing that you're not invincible and and you start treating people better so so i think yeah i don't know that that would be my parting parting shot yeah because i think also like sometimes when you enter the room it's like you know the people making a lot of the most um interactive or engaging persons but actually the person with the most to say or the most valuable insights actually the quietest person hmm. and be. i think it takes a bit of art to actually identify because you know actually the quietest person in the room actually will have the most um uh info to actually you know uh relay you know to the facilitator about what's wrong with the atmosphere or, or the organization actually so it's, it's a very very valid observation and and it's why i always um i always chat a lot yeah and people might think it's not very efficient yeah she's always wittering on and chatting well part <laughs> of that is just actually about building trust trust underpins everything that i try to do but it's also about trying to to to, to listen because when you chat and also make yourself vulnerable in some of what you share then people feel safer to do that uh, and it's a good example I, I was in a meeting a few years ago um, we had the head of nursing in the meeting and we had all the leaders of the hospital where they're talking about a transformation program and everyone was very polite and everyone said yep we're going to do these things and i sat and thought this is this isn't going to work and I got chatting to the head of nursing afterwards. She hadn't said a single bad thing about any of the proposals during that meeting. And I just got chatting. And we chatted about the fact both our kids were in local school. I'm worrying about PSLE and boom, 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 boom. She talked about her husband. Her husband was a doctor in a different hospital. I said, oh, wow, maybe your daughter will go into medicine. And she froze. I will do anything to prevent that. And I was like, oh, my goodness, OK, quite worrying. And then she started honestly sharing her concerns. And all of this had been underpinning her behavior in the meeting. And I was able to then start working at how we can work together and try to design a solution together. But because she hadn't felt, she didn't want to be seen to be a troublemaker. She didn't feel as powerful as the rest of the people in the room. So she just took the notes of what she needed to do. And then she was trying to force it out because she didn't really believe in it. She had concerns, but didn't feel empowered to raise them. She was then just pushing it onto her staff and saying, yeah, I know, I don't agree with that either. We've got to do it. So you can see how a very small little situation where people don't feel safe can, can manifest into bigger challenges. So it's as Ruben says, the issues are complex. I, I'm, I'm an optimist. I believe we can always find a way around, but it's not quick. It's not quick journey. Yeah. 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 I think that's great. I think, yeah, empowering people, it's, it's definitely a, 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 a very big problem these days. I mean, humans are complex um, precisely because of, of our brains, I think every little brain is is different behind our heads. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the empowerment, I guess, uh, that's definitely crucial. But thank you for sharing it. It's, it's great to hear you. You know, working with like people from civil engineering background and wearing possibly yellow yellow helmets and white boots around to like nurses. You know, people in jackets. So yeah, I think that's that's um, the variety of people that you meet in life. I think that probably adds to you know. Um, the art behind, you know, how you conduct these interviews. Yeah, I think that's is that 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 um, that hunger for that diverse yeah. um, experience, I, which I think most of us probably have. Yeah, we we enjoy that, and also walking to situations that seem impossible. I have a weird warped character, where when people say this is impossible, it makes me feel no, I don't believe you. I'm just, <laughs> however, that probably also means I carry a lot of trauma on my shoulders <laughs> to to pick up on that narrative. <laughs> The long chat. Well, yeah, I should so, leave. leave yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this can go on. This is over drinks. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for sharing, guys. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks Thank for the you, first. Um, yeah, it was really great. I enjoyed myself. So, um, hope so. you did too. <laughs> yes. I'm giving you a jazz hand clap. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All Thank right. You so Thank you. We'll catch up. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.